All right, let's bring in the panel now. I know your time is valuable, so I really appreciate you all taking the time. First of all, Dr. Sheikh, anyone who's been following the news closely can see that this is a system in crisis. There's not even the faintest question there. Some have even referred to it as a system in collapse. Paint a picture for us, because it's one thing to read about what's happening. It's another to experience it. Well, I think our healthcare system, like every healthcare system in the world, has faced tremendous strain from the COVID-19 pandemic as well as we had many challenges going into the pandemic that have only gotten worse. And for example, our hospitals routinely operate at 100% or more capacity. And every flu season, you would see that our emergency departments would be overwhelmed and our hospitals would be overrun. We've always had this issue for a very long time of patients who are awaiting long-term care, and that's been in the news a lot lately. And all of these things have just gotten worse since COVID. But you know, the bones of our healthcare system are strong. The, the bones of Medicare are strong, and we need to build on that foundation and ensure that our healthcare system continues to provide care based on people's need rather than ability to pay. So that's one perspective. Others have referred to this as a system in collapse, Andre. And it's interesting because this crisis is a little familiar to me. I mean, we all remember hallway medicine. Uh, we it's not as if ER closures are anything new, but something does feel different this time. Do you look at this as a system in collapse? I think our system has profound structural problems. Uh, I agree with the, the previous speaker that I think we have good principles, you know, that no one should be denied care because of an inability to pay. But I don't think we've created a system to deliver on that. We have a very shaky foundation, a very poor primary care, a very uh, hospital-centric system. Uh, that's really top heavy and doesn't do enough primary care. So I think every problem we have in Canada is really structural in nature. We have great healthcare workers, uh, we have good principles, but we just haven't put them into action with a good system to deliver on those principles. Catherine, would you agree with that assessment? Well, I prefer to as the Titanic and it's sinking. And it goes back a long, long way with cuts uh, to nursing back in the previous PC government. Uh, the Liberals not doing anything about it over the years. And you know what? During the, uh, If we dial back to SARS, if we looked at that SARS commission report where the late Justice Archie Campbell said, you need to pay attention to your human health resources. And if there's ever another pandemic, we will be in trouble. No one looked at that report and took it serious, and they should have, because here we are in another pandemic, and we're in trouble. We are talking about our healthcare system today, David, and it is not an exaggeration to say that people are literally dying waiting for care. But, uh, you know, this is just a couple of headlines from the past year alone. A Montreal woman, 91, dies waiting seven hours for an ambulance. Patient dies in ER at Red Deer Regional Hospital as wait times spike 14 hours on the weekend. And this just happened. A woman says she blacked out from pain during a 19-hour wait in Windsor before learning she has cancer. These are far from extraordinary. That's right. And I think the problem is that we've taken the principle of ability to pay, which CARP certainly endorses that you should not be denied that on the grounds of inability to pay. But we've translated that into this almost religious fervor or fear of the P word, privatization. In Ontario right now, we have five, six, seven tiers of healthcare with privatization everywhere. Try and get a physiotherapist, try to get a dentist. Try. So we've already got this. And the notion that the government has to both pay, which is valid, equalize out, take care of the people that can't pay, but also be the manager and the supplier and the administrator and the deliverer of these services when in fact the world is populated with other jurisdictions that are not identified with runaway you know, capitalism, but have hybrid models where the government still looks after the people that can't pay and yet is able to increase the supply. And I agree with what you said about cutbacks to nursing. We have a supply problem. We have a human resources problem. And the idea that the government as a single funnel is going to be able to fix it, run it, deliver it all by themselves, our members can't wait any longer. And we are not interested in ideology. We're interested in outcomes. Outcomes, And I don't see how we can get the outcomes without loosening this up a little bit. Well, so. and I also think, Dr. Gorfinkel, that a lot of the pressure on our hospitals and our emergency rooms more recently stems from the fact that so many Canadians 
don't have a family doctor. And so the makeup of who's ending up in the emergency room looks a little bit different than, say, some of these European countries. I mean, people are ending up there for requisitions for blood work or for stitches. Um, is there a shortage of GPs? What's going on? So it's a serious issue, and it's happening on several levels. Not only are there not enough family doctors to go around, but the family doctors who are there are not being utilized to their top efficiency. So in addition to dealing with more retirements, early retirements than we expected, we're dealing with the record high levels of burnout right now and mental health problems among clinicians. Mm -hmm. So these all add to the problems that COVID-19 has already set us up for. Absenteeism in record high numbers. And when doctors cannot work for 10 days or sometimes longer because of being infected with COVID-19, it sets us even further behind that eight ball. All right, hold that thought because we'll pick this up on the other side. Don't go away. Mm -hmm.